Hey there, everybody. I wanted to let you know that coming to Pendleton, Oregon on Saturday, June 29th, it's Jackalope Jamboree featuring American Aquarium, Shane Smith and the Saints, Lily Hyatt, Carson McCone, Pete Krebs, and Jamie Wyatt, plus Tyler and the Train Robbers, Bart Budwig, James Dean Kendall and the Eastern Oregon Playboys, the Lonesome Billies, and more! Taking place across two stages at Pendleton's historic Happy Canyon Arena, located in Northeast Oregon. It's going to be a full day of live music, paired with local food, craft beer, and wine. Camping and RV spaces are available, too. Tickets on sale now at jackalopejamboree.com, and our listeners can get 15% off their ticket order by entering promo code WALKINGTHEFLOOR. That's jackalopejamboree.com, promo code Walking the Floor. Hey, it's Will Hogue, and you're listening to Walking the Floor. I'm walking the floor over you. Walking the floor. I'm walking the floor. Walking the floor over you. Hola, senores and senoritas. This is Chris Shiflett, and you are listening to another fine, fine, fine edition of Walking the Floor. It's a very fine edition today of Walking the Floor. It's a beautiful day here in uh, sunny Southern California. I'm just sitting here looking out at the at the sun, and there's a little breeze, and my cat's just like sitting in the window, and and life is good. I can't complain. As a matter of fact. I'm going out tonight, which is pretty weird for me when I'm at home. I don't get out much, let me tell you. But I'm going out to go see Hayes Carl tonight at the Troubadour, and I'm really, really excited because I'm gonna interview him tomorrow at noon. I can't tell you how long I've been waiting to interview Hayes Carl. When I first started this podcast, I actually went to his website. He was one of the first people I ever wanted to interview because I'm just a huge, huge, huge Hayes Carl fan. So I went to his website and there was like a contact, you know, link on there. And I sent an email that I never got a response to saying like, I'm starting a podcast and I'd love to interview you or what, you know, that type of thing. And uh, and it took a few years. And as a matter of fact, I was supposed to interview him uh, when we were down. We were both down at Luck Reunion at South by Southwest uh, couple of months back and it didn't work out um things were just a little too hectic but uh oh man i'm excited gonna see him play tonight i've never seen him play live and then uh and then i'm gonna go interview him tomorrow and if you haven't heard his new record whoo you are missing out because that is really 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 good stuff that new his carl record i think i might even actually tomorrow i might be interviewing the cactus blossoms that's not locked down yet but I think I might be interviewing them tomorrow, too. So look for both of those interviews coming soon on Walking the Floor. All right, now, friends and neighbors, uh, I don't know if you know, but I got a new record coming out, new solo record coming out called Hard Lessons, coming out in the middle of June, June 14th. But you can pre-order it now on iTunes, uh, you know, the, the store over there at iTunes, and on um, and on, uh, and on what else? Amazon Prime, I think you can... Uh, you can pre-order the record and uh and you can also go to my website chris shiflet music.com and you can you can order it there pre-order it there and get a bundle get a bandana get a signed the first hundred of them i think are coming signed i signed like a hundred record sleeves the other day and the first hundred people that order them will get a signed vinyl copy of the record coming right to you soon it's like less than a month and a half, June 14th. So please get on over there now and get your pre-order together. What are you waiting for? All right. Now let's not forget that support for Walking the Floor comes from D'Addario. D'Addario, a fine maker of USA-made instrument strings and musical accessories, is committed to sustainability through the playback program, recycling over one million used instrument strings. For more information on the playback program, uh, get yourself on over to playback.dedario.com. Dedario, come on. And if you want to get some Dedario strings, get your butt on over to zounds.com. That's zounds with two Zs, where you get free shipping on every single order. No exceptions. 
No exclusions. Most orders arrive within two days. So if you need your cool music gear stuff, a guitar, a pedal, amplifier, uh, some, some pro audio gear, whatever it happens to be, get on over to zounds.com. All right, let's get to the interview. You know, I'd never met Will Hogue prior to interviewing him a few months ago. Uh, but you get a sense, I think, from certain artists through their music about like, you know, kind of who they are and, and what they're going to be like. And this man did not disappoint. I'm a huge fan of his music. He writes like great anthems and he's just a fantastic, fantastic songwriter. And I don't know, I just had a sense that he was going to be cool and an easy hang and good to talk to. And he was all those things. Uh, for those of you that are a little squeamish when we talk politics on this show, I suggest you skip the first part because we definitely go there. Um, he's got a, uh, an album that's been out for a few months called My American Dream that has a bit of a political bent to it, and we dive way deep into that. But we dive into all kinds of other stuff too, you know, music, songwriting, growing up, blah, blah, blah. All that good stuff. He was great. I hope you enjoy this as much as I did. This is Will Hogue on Walking the Floor. And I work two jobs to raise a family. So your new record, like, just came out this month. A week ago, two weeks ago, two weeks nice. ago. I think. Are, yeah. are you in the middle of like you know, crazy promo and touring and doing all that, doing the big wind up? Yeah, we just did. Uh, we just finished the Social Distortion tour. So that really, was, yeah. How was that? Fantastic. Wait, were you out there with them when Mike got in that fight? We missed that by a week. <laughs> we were out there once they started hauling security around. Right. That's where we were. Right. Well, we were worried, you know, because when we put this new record out, we were like, you know, no, you know, their political persuasion. Like, what if we get out in front of them and they're conservatives or right. you know, crazy white wingers? And then this, literally the next day, we had this conversation and we got forwarded an article and it was like, Mike Ness punches Trump fan and show. Yeah. And we were like, oh, we'll be fine on this tour. It's okay, funny, be fine. man. Like, I've been a huge Social D fan since yeah. forever. You know, I mean, they're a big influence on me, you know, Likewise. musically and, and otherwise. But I, I interviewed Mike a few years ago. I never really knew him, you know, like yeah. I had been in various bands that had toured with them. and. Mm -hmm. But never really had like a lengthy conversation, and I was, you know, Mike's kind of an intimidating yeah. dude, you yeah. know. And so, and and I sat down to interview him, and I was blown away at how sort of progressive he was. He started talking about animal rights and shit. Like I was like, yeah. what? I thought you were from Orange County, bro. I know. And he's, you know, <laughs> what are you like, talking about? We laughed. He he must have eaten his weight in Impossible Burgers this whole tour. <laughs> I mean, you know, we were just. Uh, it was really. It was cool, man. And the whole band. I mean, you know, that band is oh, really great, yeah. good. Yeah. And the catalog of songs is is great. I love how they do the old stuff. Yeah. You know, like I love how they do Prison Bound. With, mm -hmm. I don't know, because we, we toured them a few years ago and they had like, you know, the Hammond on it. Yeah. You know, stuff to kind of kind of roots it out a yep. little bit, you know. And they still do, which was cool. And then, you know, they would do stuff, um, you know, in the middle of the tour, they all of a sudden added different songs and we're playing them at different, you know, different tempos. And you right. could just tell that it was guys that have played together a long time. Yeah. yeah. Was there, was there any like backlash from, for on their tour from that, that whole thing? Like, were there like, you so. know, protesting no. angry Trump people? No, out no, there no, no. There really that? weren't. I mean, I think that, I mean, and that's the thing I think that we realized on it. I mean, you know, they've been a band for so long and I think that he's written and addressed some of those progressive ideals over the years so i think that they've probably weeded out the majority of people it's an interesting thing though in the world of punk rock and, yeah. and, and granted you know they've been at that for a long time it's not like there's some punker dunker band or whatever right. but i i've always been kind of blown away at how deep a sort of libertarian strain there is in in that world yeah you know less progressive more like you know don't tread on me yeah, fuck the federal government or whatever. You know that right. whole kind of strain. I guess that you know it sort of lends itself to that. But it's I've never my personal experience is is that it's not a very progressive community. Oftentimes, especially in on the fan base side of it. Yeah, and I don't know enough. I mean, you know, I didn't grow. I grew up loving their records, and and I love punk rock. I guess sort of at a distance, right. and and some of that was. There wasn't a ton of great punk rock coming out of Nashville, Tennessee, right. you know, when I was growing up. So, um, you know, I loved it in sort of old friends, older brothers record collections way. So, but I didn't go to those shows. Didn't you know they weren't playing Nashville very often? Right. So I didn't see any of those shows. Yeah, and it's yeah, interesting. Yeah. I mean, even seeing it now, um, I can see where that might not be 
the most progressive place. <laughs> but uh, well, it's it, funny. Even great, like man. it's funny you say it because even like you know in in the nineties before I was in Foo Fighters, I was in a band called No Use for a Name. Yeah, and um, we toured a lot. You know, we tour coast to coast all the time. I don't think we ever played Nashville. Right. You know, we would play Atlanta. We'd get down into Florida because Florida had a surf scene and the yep. surf scene liked punk rock. You know, so there were places, you know, it's not like we didn't tour the South or anything. Yeah. But we never played Nashville. Yeah. I mean, we just didn't I don't really. think we played Memphis. Like, we didn't play anywhere around there. Mm-hmm. You, know? you know, we laugh about that. Alan, my drummer, is from just Nowhereville, Mississippi. I mean, tiny, tiny Mississippi. And he grew up really loving all of that stuff. And, you know, I mean, we've laughed all the time. He's like, you know, I'd have to drive to. New Orleans or somewhere else. Maryland to, or something. Yeah, <laughs> right. 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 To drive to Ohio to yeah. see a, a punk rock show. I mean, so you mentioned your, your new record has a, like a political bent to it. You know, it's sort of tagged a political record. Like, is that a tag that you're comfortable with? Um, I don't love it, but I also can't. I mean, I can't write those songs and then go, oh, no, it's not political at all. Right. I mean, it, I mean, you you deal with, like, you know, for people listening that maybe haven't heard the record, there's, like, you know, gun control, Trump, illegal immigration, Southern stereotypes. So it's, like, it's all in there. Yeah. You know? Um, I mean, it's a very political record. And, like, I said, I'd be doing the record injustice and probably leading people astray if I tried to act like it wasn't. Right. You know, but we're also not... Um, the thing I've wanted to make sure didn't happen, you know, our shows aren't going to be political rallies and right. that's really important right, to me because right, right. I don't want that. You know, I want our shows to be a rock and roll show where people come and have a good time, but you can also think and be challenged with those things too. But yeah. you know, that was the bigger problem for me was just trying to avoid that. Is there any pushback from your fan base on, on yeah. that? Oh really? <laughs> yeah. Interesting. I mean, you know, you don't grow up in, in the South and make, roots records and you know and i and i had some success in the in the real quote unquote real country world like mainstream country, mainstream right. country world as a writer and you know and a lot of those artists have been really kind to me and the genre was pretty open to what i was doing for a, a little bit there so i mean i don't i don't dislike any of that but that's not exactly talk about punk rock not being progressive that's <laughs> Punk rock is Antifa compared to, you know, <laughs> mainstream country. Well, it's funny, you know, how, like, how does the sort of American, the business side of Americana deal with an outspoken artist? Because I, you know, I don't find people in business in general, regardless, you know, Americana is sort of branded as a, uh, you know, um, a, maybe a more progressive sort it's of country strain music of, for liberals. Right, yeah. exactly. You yeah. know what I mean? But like, I don't find that to be all that true and like how does the business side of you know business people tend to think in terms of business friendly yeah well, I mean, ideas, there's no qu- you know? yeah and there's no qu- i mean even this record i mean it's a terrible business idea <laughs> <laughs> there's, no, there's nothing good nobody is going like you know what we really want to try to market it's <laughs> right. something that is guaranteed to yeah. piss off a fairly large amount of people i mean no, yeah. nobody wants that but um i mean you know that we don't Art isn't always good business. Well, we're living through this crazy time, you know, yeah. that, uh, and especially these last couple of years, like it's, in my view, it's, you know, it's, it's a, it's a rejection of neoliberal economic policy or just neoliberal policy sure. in general. And, you know, you have these like two different strains of that. There's like the left wing version of populism and a right wing version of populism. Right. The Democratic Party has just done a better of job of squashing their populist uprising Mm -hmm. you know which is i think it's a it's an interesting thing to deal with because a lot of the the issues that you raise on your record to me aren't going to be solved by electing another corporate owned democrat i don't think it's going to be solved by one election or one individual right and i hope that i mean i'm glad he's i hope the songs i mean really and truly at the end of the day i don't know that i'm a they're not these pro Democrat and all Republican. Right. I mean, Nikki's a Republican now. It's fairly pointed at, yeah, at yeah, Republican. Yeah. But is um, that an autobiographical song? Like, did you know? Is is Nikki a? I went to school and grew up with a lot of Nikki's. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> there, was a, there were a handful, more than a handful of Nikki's in my experience. But uh, you, you know what I mean? Like what like what I'm getting at? Like like I think it's it's. And I say this from a like probably a more left wing view than the vast majority of the sure. world out there. I'm not a Republican. I'm not. I don't really care about Republicans. I'm right. not one. I'm, my criticism is more reserved for my side of the aisle. Yeah, you know what I mean. And I think it's really tempting in the age of Trump 
and I see a lot of people around me. I, mean, I live here in California. Mm-hmm. It's like the you know the professional class you know base of yeah. the Democratic Party. I don't see people really going through a gut check. Right. These last couple of years, you know? Yeah. And it scares me because I, I want to see Trumpism defeated or made irrelevant. And I feel like most people just want to defeat Trump. And those two things are not, that's not the same thing. No, I mean, another... he is the, he's the name that they've stuck on it. But, right. you know, his totalitarian and authoritarian ideals, that's not new. I mean, you know, and, yeah. if you, and that's where... I think we haven't done a great job as progressives of really pointing that. Like, I don't, I don't give a shit about defeating Republicans. You know, I, I long for the days when the Republican Party was just um, conservative and they wanted things to change slower than I wanted them to change. And we right. could disagree about economically how we do things and right. all of those deals. But you know, the the mainstream of what Trump is become the figurehead for is way bigger than than that. It's not a difference in economic policy or anything like that anymore. Right. You know? I think it is, though, uh, uh, you have to go through Ronald Reagan mm-hmm. and George Bush and Clinton and Obama and W. and all. You have to go through all those people and their policies, which are, you know, there are some major differences, but on terms right. of economic policy, it's not that different. Well, I mean, and the even- Democrats have really embraced, you know, the more or less the same economic policies as the Republicans over the years. And you sort of see that deindustrialization of, of America and globalization and, and what mm-hmm. that has produced. And now, right now, is people standing up going, yeah, fuck that, that doesn't work for me. i got to work three jobs. I can't support my family. The public school my kids go to is crumbling. So you sort of have to address that stuff. We do. And, and you know? I don't think as Americans we like, we don't like hard answers. Right. We want these like sound bites. We want the we want the bumper sticker. Yeah. We want the pill. Like I don't want to be fat anymore. What do I do? Nobody <laughs> wants to hear like you gotta change your diet and exercise every day, and you got to do it every day for the rest of your life. It's not something like you don't just eat this pill and you're like I look like a cover girl model yeah. now. It's not how it works. Yeah. And we um, it does work like that in L.A. Does it? <laughs> it's really expensive. It's not a pill say. though. It's yeah. a, it's a, you it's know, a vacuum it's, cleaner yeah. and a, a scalpel. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean that's a that's a scary thing for us. I think that we've got to, and it's interesting. I think you know we're getting of the age where there's not. Um, this used to be our parents would fix it. You know, there was always somebody older than us that would go. Yeah. Well, you know, they they know what it is. The and they'll experts. figure it out. They, they're yeah, going to come in out. and fix it. Yeah, and you start looking around, and it's like and all of a sudden it. we're the. The one, you know, our kids are looking at us and going. <laughs> That's such a scary thought. It's terrifying, as, as, man. As in, you're a dad, right? Yeah, I got yeah, two I'm boys. a dad too. Like, I don't feel like an expert. I know. <laughs> well, and then you start to realize that none of those people were like yes. all the people we looked at. Well, that's what you realize too when you when you grow up and you're like. I mean, I've had the, um, you know, the, I've I've been, I've been around a lot of like of the political class yeah. over the years from you know, whatever from playing being in right. Washington and playing fundraisers and things like that yep. and you kind of have that moment where you go oh my god these motherfuckers are stupid yeah they're, <laughs> they're as dumb as we yeah, are totally. like they're a bunch of fucking drummers it's yeah. totally fine yeah <laughs> we can't say that on this show oh man. sorry <laughs> wait fucking or drummers which yeah, one drummers, you mean? oh drummers. okay good yeah, you, no, we can't real, make fun of the drummers. real bad word okay. yeah, yeah exactly okay. yeah um so you okay that uh you mentioned growing up in Nashville. Um, for people listening that have never been to Nashville, and I, I only have been to Nashville much in the last, like, say, 20 years or yeah. so. But you grew up there. Uh-huh. I mean, how has that place changed? It's such a boom town now. And I and when I go do go there and spend a little time there, I hear people that have lived there for a long time sort of complaining about the development and all this stuff. How has it changed over the course of, of your life? Um, probably in ways that you would hear people talk about L.A. in the... 50s and 60s, I would mm. think. You know, there's just a point where you don't get a lot of those true boom moments, like you mentioned. I mean, yeah. and, and it really is funny to watch. I mean, you know, and the people that complain about it, I mean, there's things that obviously we could do better uh, infrastructure and transportation. You know, it's just, t- I mean, there's 100 people a day moving to Nashville. Moving to Nashville. Right. And did it feel more like a small town, big city, small town kind of yeah, when you were a kid? For a long time. And, like, and honestly, not a big city, small town. It just felt like a small town right? with right. a little bit of concrete, you know, in a four block radius downtown. But you always had the, the, um, the music business there. Like, yeah. did you grow up 
I imagine be like, I think about it sort of in context of my kids. Mm-hmm. You know, we live in LA. I'm raising my kids in LA. Yeah. They go to school with like the children of famous actors yeah. and people in the entertainment business and musicians and all that sort of stuff. Like, mm-hmm. was it like the, were you going to school with like Ernest Tubbs kids? And shit like yeah. That? Well, and it was fun. Yeah, you were. And that was the thing to me that was the most encouraging thing about wanting to be a musician and growing up in Nashville is you saw the, the normalcy mm. of it. Right. You know, so like you were in school with not, not, and not even the big superstars. I mean, there were those kids, but there were also like the guy that was just the front of house dude. Right. For, um, uh, Merle Haggard, yeah, you know, yeah, would, yeah. would his kids would go to school there. Right. And the guy or that like was like side man or whatever. Yeah. The right. bass player in yeah, some, yeah, yeah. you know, country band that hadn't had a hit in 20 years, but they were working and they were musicians. And yeah. So it was cool. Um, and it's still an interesting thing. You know, one of the really, cool things about being from there and now with my kids is i mean you know how hard it is being away and you know how hard it is for your kids to you know miss you and things like that but you know they're also in a class where i mean my kindergartner uh, when he was in kindergarten you know there was uh taylor swift's drummer was had a kid in his class and Dirk Bentley's bass player and <laughs> right, so it's like you know right. when the kid comes yeah. to school and he's sad that his dad's on tour there's they four other kids it. that are like come here yeah, you know yeah, it's okay yeah. we're all sad because dads are gone yeah and it's cool for the, you know the wives have a support group and, right yeah so right. It, it's a really unique city in that way it's and it's, it's been fun to watch it I had a funny like we like I said we just wrapped up a tour cycle and so I've been gone a lot you know yeah. in the last year and a half and you can always tell like at the end of a cycle when it's starting to strain uh-huh. you know when your kids are kind of like yeah it used to be they get sad now they're sort of indifferent which I think makes it worse for me totally you know what I mean they don't but even like, miss you anymore yeah, like, wait, you know, wait, wait, wait. well exactly like I was like you know I was coming home last week and I called my wife. She's like, well, you know, the kids all have like sleepovers the night you get home. Mm-hmm. I'm like, fuck, no way. Are you uh-huh. kidding? I want to see my guys. And she's like, well, I know. I said that. And Dashiell was like, and that just, he's here. He's gone. I, you know, he's, he comes and goes all the time. Why does, why does it matter? Yeah. Why do I have to change yeah, my it, schedule it, for exactly, him? Yeah. I know. And I get that point of view, but I was like, oh, I know. Boy. You're like, no, you need to want me to be exactly, here. Exactly. You yeah. should drop everything. Yeah. No, they don't. No. Totally over it. No, they don't. So what, so, and your dad was a musician. Is that right? Yeah. He grew up, um, he and my uncle were in that wave of, you know, the, the Beatles on Ed Sullivan mm. and then everybody bought guitars and right. started bands and so in nashville uh my uncle was a little bit older and he had a band that played in printer's alley back when that was you know this really almost speakeasy kind of night hangout and yeah. they were doing kind of like four seasons really harmony oriented stuff and then wow. my old man's band was doing kind of the beatlesy thing and and they yeah they did a fair bit of that all the way through kind of birth of children and then got out and got real jobs oh so by the time you were like by the time i was a kid by the time yeah he was done i mean they would still occasionally do like a reunion show for their did he still play around the house so like i'm curious if that made you want to play music or was like made you go like i ain't gonna do that no he didn't play around the house but the thing he did have like the record collection was stellar right i mean you know when people ask that you know and you get it all the time too it's like you know what were the what'd you listen to growing up and it was like man i had i had every great record from 1964 to 1975 right right alphabetized and still in shrink wrap you know, perfectly really? done. Yeah. Your dad was that kind he's, of record he's still, collector. It's still See, like, get away from the record collection. Totally. Like, didn't touch it. Like, they're slit with a razor blade. Right, it's, nice. uh, it's, it's what I'll retire on when he's gone. Yeah. <laughs> nice. I'm just killing my music time until right. he kicks the bucket and I can yeah. sell his record collection. No, uh, yeah. So he, he didn't grow up playing, but he grew up. I grew up. There was this huge love of music, right. and the way it was talked about, it was really. Um, revered i think right. is the best right. way that i could put it you know music was important and like he, he you know he would tell these great stories it was always really romantic mm. to me you know um you know because they had toured with the almond joys you know greg and Dwayne really? Allman before the That's, almond brothers right. and yeah, so yeah. um you know he would tell these stories about the and you know those guys were like really heroes to sure. me especially as a really young musician and so you'd hear these stories and they were really kind of larger 
than life. Yeah. Um, so those things were always super romantic. Yeah. And so when did you start playing? Like, was guitar your first? Yeah, play? I didn't get a guitar until I was a senior in high school. Really? Uh, mm-hmm. Wow, you're giving me so much hope for my own children because uh, <laughs> my because this has been like like the bane of my existence for right. since I had kids. It's sort of having that balance of like I really want them to play, but I don't want to ruin it. Yeah, you don't want to be a showbiz wanna, daddy, either. exactly. And I don't right. want to be like forcing on. It. I want them to want to uh-huh. do it. Yeah, my kids like all kids these days. They don't really listen to a lot of music that has guitars. There's you know? not a lot of it anymore. Is no, there? and you know they listen to a lot of hip hop, which is all well and good. But like, I really want them to yeah want to play guitar. Last night, I actually went upstairs, and my kids were... I bought my youngest son a bass, and they were sitting there learning Seven Nation Army off of YouTube. Yes. Which I was like, fucking finally! Go! And yeah. it didn't happen. And you back out of the totally. room. Like, exactly. Like, I was like, I didn't even want to react. Uh, I didn't want to go, like, this is the best thing. Let me, no, just, just, let me get involved. I just tried to pretend like, I'm not even here. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I yeah. don't know if you have that similar experience with your own children. But anyway, so, so you didn't get a... Uh, a guitar yourself until the 12th grade that's that's fascinating yeah. um and i had grown up you know singing was sort of the that was easy and that was kind of the first thing just growing mm. up you know we had little garage bands in the neighborhood and stuff right. like that and, I'd and sing. you'd sing yeah um but yeah and then once i got a guitar and started writing pretty quickly after that and then it was just all down here i mean i, I tried college for <laughs> about half a year and, and why do you why do you think you started writing because a lot of people don't pick up a guitar and start writing they just you know learn some songs or whatever and you know go that route and i mean as a guitar you know you may be different i don't i never wanted and it shows i never wanted to be a great guitar player right. i, I want to always be a better guitar player yeah but i was always fascinated by you know i remember as an early teen you know stevie ray vaughn kind of hit and that was the thing everybody was like i want to play guitar i want to be stevie ray vaughn right and I loved Stevie Ray Vaughan, and I wanted the blues was so interesting to me, but not as a. I never wanted to be this guitar. I never saw that as a guitar player thing. I saw it as a singer songwriter right, thing. Right. And um, so I think that some of the writing for me was, um, I wasn't good enough to play other people's songs. Right. Really and truly. Yeah. And yeah. so it became, um, you know, I know the G, the C, and the D chord. Uh, I can make up a story around that. Right. So that right. was kind of the the gateway drug, I guess. And so what was like what was your pathway to sort of becoming a, you know, however you want to call it, professional musician or whatever? Like, were you, if you didn't start playing until twelfth grade, mm-hmm. how when was how quickly was that moment for you where you sort of realized you were a lifer where that was the where you were? Pretty to go? quickly. I mean, my first year of college, I joined a band. There were some dudes, I mean, I literally like and you sound so ancient when you say shit like this, but like in the dorm, there was a piece of paper with like right. looking for a singer with the shit that you pull off right. at the bottom with the phone right. number yeah, on yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I remember, I, you know, I called these guys and uh, joined a band. And shortly after that, by what should have been my second year of college, I mean, we were we were playing pretty regularly just right. around, you know, Nashville and Kentucky. We I, I was in school in Kentucky and Bowling Green. And so we were sort of playing around there and, by six months later, I quit school and was doing this and chasing it pretty hard. And then moved back home and started other bands. And then um, within... What did your, your parents say? You know, that's an interesting thing. Cause, and I don't, uh, mine were really supportive until I quit school. Right. There was that moment where it was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah. You know, this was a cute hobby. And they'd be at the shows and real supportive. And then... Um, yeah, once you kind of bail and it becomes, you know, high wire walking without a net, they're like, wait, 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 wait. Um, and it took probably a good year and a half, two years of work. And, and then once I started um, making a record, I think then this, they realized like, oh, okay, he's, he's serious about it. It's not. And your first record, did you put it out yourself or it came out on an indie or something then it got picked up by a major? Yeah, I'll put out a, well, the first record was really a live record. We had recorded a board mix at the Exit Inn in Nashville years ago. And we had just started touring kind of regionally and um, was that a, would that have been a normal thing to do? To like, well, I think back to when I was in you know my early bands. We never thought about touring. There was no regional tour circuit to to go on. Yeah, you know what I mean. It was just never 
entered our, our minds. But I thought that was interesting that you started touring before you were making records. That was the first thing. Um, and that was an interesting thing about the Southeast in particular. I mean, my first record, I guess that was 99. And there was such an interesting thing. You know, live music seemed to still be a bit more of a thing at that point. And especially in the Southeast, you know, you had these bands like um, Hootie and the Blowfish that were just this college band, but they would tour around. You know, there was still this like college scene that you could go and play and people would come out and there were record labels that paid attention to it and things mm. like that. And then you still had, you know, there were still holdovers from, you know, the REM days in Athens and you had guys like the Drive-By Truckers and these bands that right. really did, you know, in the Southeast, there was a pretty healthy just touring circuit. Right. Kind of like you hear about the old Chitlin circuit. It was right, kind of right. the... Uh, plastic cup circuit i guess for lack of a better term <laughs> but yeah so we started doing that and um and that's when my folks finally kind of eased up and right. said well fuck it we've lost him to the to the muse so how did it go from doing it yourself to getting a label involved like so we how, did that, how'd you get signed or what? um i signed you know it, it, another thing in nashville you know there's a publishing structure and songwriting mm -hmm. deals and things like that and there was a guy that i had been in he was the guitar player in my dad's band for years and he was a music publisher and he signed me to a an artist deal like you would in new york or one of those things with a right. publisher and um out of that i was able to fund my first record and so we did a right and proper studio album we did part of it in nashville and part of it uh in memphis and then put that out on her own and for a year just went and toured. And then Atlantic picked up that record. Um, and then we kind of just went from there. With You mentioned having a, a publishing deal mm -hmm. as a writer. So were you like in those like three guys in a room sessions, you know, Monday through Friday kind of I, thing? Was I wasn't that? at that point. This one was much more like um, probably just the tradition or so, traditional artist. Okay. Publishing deal, like go write right. your songs and right, make right, your right. record. I think they probably would have loved me to have done that. I was. Did terrible. you eventually do that? Have you had years like, have you later done after uh, I'd written a song called "Even If It Breaks Your Heart," which was a uh, a country hit for some guys in the Eli Young band, and that one led to a real traditional Nashville publishing deal. And right. I did a full two or three years of that, sitting in a room, trying to make up songs for people that you don't know and how does that work i've always wondered the sort of the business side of those deals yeah. so do you get an advance or a salary or something like yeah. that and then what happens if one of your songs is a hit like mm -hmm. does what you if you have say a third of that song mm -hmm. or whatever how does everything that they've given you thus far is it like any other kind of record deal publishing deal? everything gets recouped and then eventually you wind up getting a royalty on yeah that? And, and so what's the equation like how many songs how many hit songs or cuts do you have to get to be sort of like, you know, making a good a good living. Well, it depends. I mean, you know, it depends on how big a lump of cash you take up front. Right. Know? But those guys have got it. it. That's the most sterile. Like there are operating rooms that are less sterile than some of those things. <laughs> right. I mean, you know, those deals just come in and it's, you know, they go and just to the penny go, okay, you're worth this amount of money. We're willing right. to bet, you know, 30 grand a year that if you write 12 songs, we'll make some money. Right. You know, but then I think a lot of young writers get lost in the idea though. If you owe a company 12 songs a year, I mean, shit, man, we, you and I probably write 12 songs a year in our sleep. But if you write with three people, then you owe them 36 songs a year. Oh, you no only, shit. Really? Yeah. Okay. And so, you know, then all and of a sudden, isn't it kind of assumed that you're going to write with three? Yeah. Isn't that like just sort of the norm? Yeah. But in those meetings, you know, you don't, there's some doe-eyed little kid in there that's 20 years old that's just going, wait, you're going to pay me. And, of course, they'll lowball, you know, we'll give you $20,000 a year, and all you got to do is write 12 songs. <laughs> it's like, cool. Right. Like, we're going to write with these three people, and then you're right. like, 36 songs. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, it's an interesting world. And there's guys and girls, I uh, I learned a lot doing it. And there's guys and girls that are really, really good at it. Yeah. I mean, the kind that can just sit, Right, you know, finish this interview and go, okay, let's write a song. Yeah. And hum something, and in two or three hours, there's a mildly palatable, completely non-offensive, 
song with a nice melody and yeah, yeah. a story that won't offend anybody and it's it's interesting it's like you know i haven't done a lot of that i've never been like yeah i've never lived yeah. in nashville and i've never worked in that songwriting yeah. culture but i have written with some guys out there here and there in the last few years yeah and some really good writers and stuff and it, it is a funny thing though like anything if i because i tend to write it's not like all my stuff is political, but there are political themes yeah. throughout it, or it could be, mis- you know, understood that way. Right. And I find people have a real aversion to anything that gets a little, you know, oh, that's a little dicey. What else you got? Yeah. You know, kind of, and you can just see it the minute, like, you start with something, <laughs> yeah. like, mm, yeah. what, what else you got is yeah. my favorite thing. It's like, yeah. don't say you don't. That, see, even in that, they won't just go like, no, I don't want to write that. It's like, yeah. mm, what else you got? Yeah. How can I, <laughs> how can I not offend you by saying... <laughs> You know, that I don't right. want to do that. And we laugh, you know, because they're, I mean, I've had some really good co-writes. Yeah. I'm sure you have, too. I mean, I've totally. written songs that I'm really proud of Yeah, uh, that I'll play the rest of my life that have been yeah. co-written with yeah. people. I love the process. But there's also a moment where when you get too many people and there are too many of those opinions where you start to really get into the land of if everyone is just okay with this. Like, nobody loves it anymore, but it's right. just like, is that, that's fine. Yeah. It's fine. Yeah. You know, that, not like, that's not a, fucking amazing. No, and right. even if you've got, like, one of the people that's, that's fucking amazing, and two other people that are like, I don't know. Like, yeah. I'd rather hear that song, I think, than the one where three people are going, yeah, it's that'll work. totally fine. <laughs> that rhymes. <laughs> right. You know, like, oh, good, it rhymes. Yeah. Thanks, we're professionals. Yeah. It rhymed. Funny. Yeah. So okay, so then you you wind up getting signed to who was it Atlantic? Atlantic. So you're in major label land. Yeah. How, how did you find that experience? I'm I'm especially curious because you put out records in in like a lot of different ways through indies. And yeah. Yourself through major labels. So I'm I'm curious like which sort of version of all that you enjoyed the most or was well you know, or just was, worked best for you. Man, um, They've all worked really similar as far as the the seat that I'm in because I think I'm probably hard headed enough in most of the right ways that I mean I don't get it's not like when I made major label records they were going okay you have to do this you know they would there were obviously more opinions for who producers were and how you right. kind of needed to do things and your songs are like anthemic a lot of them it seems like it would lend itself to you know. Yeah, well, that, I mean, the, and the major world. label world was interesting because I do think at the end of the day, they want hit songs. Sure. They don't care if it's hip hop or country. It really right. doesn't matter. And right, I don't right, mean right. that as a complaint. They just right. want something that they can sell at the radio. Yeah. And I do, I mean, I grew up, I still think of radio. When I think about songs, when I think about a chorus that's something you want to sing, I mean, I still think of. I imagine that coming on a radio in my car when I'm driving, even if people don't listen to music that way anymore. Right, so, I mean, right. I think that the major label world was an interesting journey for me because that is, that's the path to get to that place. Um, yeah. But it was, uh, it was just, it's all, it's a lot of politics. Right. And, um, you know, you, you also realize really quickly that you're the you're the little fish in this really really massive pond you know i remember right. i'd never been on an airplane and uh we signed our deal we finished a sold out show and i flew my first flight out here to la to sign you know this paperwork and do all this and you know we came and we were at caa at the time and i remember going in the lobby of that office and going holy shit like the fact that we sold 600 tickets in Greenville, South Carolina last night does not mean shit right. to these people. Like, right. It's not, right. you know, you just start going like, oh man, I've got to really perform on a massive level to, to this, keep to really, these people's attention. To, to really matter to yeah. these guys. Right. And, um, you know, at the time I had, uh, I had two offers on the table. One was Atlantic Records with Ahmed Erdogan. I mean, which is like this dream come true right. for a, a rock and roll kid from sure. Nashville. And then the other option was this new indie label from Nashville called Lost Highway. And they had two artists. One was this lady, Lucinda Williams, that nobody had heard of. And yeah, the yeah. other one was this guy, Ryan Adams. Right. You know, and, there was, and 
at the time, you know, I didn't have great management helping me with it. But, you know, you just go, what, what are my options? And, yeah. You know, the big shiny ball in New York seems like a really cool, that's what the rock and roll dreams are made of. Right, you know? yeah, yeah. But I remember at the time, the Lost Highway guys, they sent an envelope to my manager, and it said, uh, there were two envelopes inside the envelope, and one said Lost Highway, and one said Atlantic. And when you dumped the Lost Highway envelope open, it had a little piece of paper that said Lucinda Williams, and one that said Ryan Adams, and one that said Will Hogue. And then the other one was every artist on Atlantic and their right. names. And they said, you know, which one is easier to find your artist in? And that probably should have been a more powerful um, realization for me at the time. It's but easy to look back now and go like, it oh, is. I, you know, who, why didn't we know that? But like, you know, in that moment, yeah. you can't possibly know. No. The shiny ball is fucking, it's, yeah. it's inviting. It is. <laughs> you know? You know? And, and again, like, you know, you I go back and I look at, you know, you sit in the office with Ahmed Erdogan and he tells you stories about Ray Charles and Otis Redding and, and Jagger and, and yeah, like and he tells you like about your record and he, you know, what songs he likes and what right. he thinks, what he hears in it. Yeah, yeah. and I mean, and I, and it it was sincere and you yeah. know and so shit. I mean, as a uh, a rock and roll fan, and then you look at your Led Zeppelin records and you see the Atlantic logo on it. You go, yeah, like, fuck, yeah. I want that on my record. Fuck you know, yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's just that's what I've learned through most of this is just that it's a it's there's not a lot of right or wrong choices. There's yeah. just this is the decision and then you take the good and the bad with it. Right. And, um and the same thing the reality too is the same thing could ha- could happen at either label. Totally. Well, know? there's going to be problems at either and right. you know and and so yeah, you know, did that for a couple of years and then left Atlantic uh, I made what was really my first sort of political record in 2004. I did a thing called the America EP. And um, we had done okay at Atlantic, and they were real supportive. And we came to them with this project, and they said, look, we love this, and we support what you're saying. But you know, if these are the kinds of records you want to make, I don't know that we should be involved. And so I said, okay, then I should go somewhere else. We parted, and I'm still friends with all those people. The Atlantic folks have been supportive when we've been on the road with their artists over the years. But So I left and started doing it on my own again. And it's, it's, it's a funny thing that like the business side of, of this world are very... Un- like if you had written... They'll call you an outspoken artist or whatever, you know, yeah. whatever little thing if it's like left-wing right. views. Yeah. But if it's like jingoistic, like America's fucking great, yeah. this one's for the troops. Uh-huh. Like, Nobody Kick all the brown the people they in the wait, 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 yeah. This doesn't align with our, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know. Our, They're like, we should get Lee Greenwood to cut this song. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, you know what I right. mean? No, there's yeah. none of that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so then um, left and did a couple records on my own and then... S- did a couple records with an indie label in New York called Ryko Disc. Mm. Um, and then back on my own and then started working with the 30 Tigers crew in Nashville. And Is that who you put your records out through now? It is. And that's what we've done the last four records, three or four records with. And um, I mean, how, does, how, do your expect, how have your expectations of releasing an album changed over the years? It's, it's such a weird thing nowadays to like when... At least for me, when I put out a solo record, I just go, well, this is, nobody's going to fucking buy this thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Hopefully we can get some streams. Well, and that's know? what's funny is, you know, we were laughing. We got the first, um, and I try really hard not to pay too much attention to that. And I damn sure don't want to be Mr. First Week guy. You know, like, what right. you it's not like you're doing movies in L.A. at that moment. It's like, what was the opening week like? But, yeah, yeah. you know, you do, you look, and you at least want to know, you know, who bought the record, where, and, yeah. you know, you get what we were laughing was the sound scan report, you know, but they send us now what's called a consumption report. And mm. it's, str- like and it disease. was, it does. And it was, <laughs> I felt like I was in college again. Cause yeah. it was just, it was like, I was looking at this thing and going, I don't know what the fuck any of this means. So I don't, I mean, the expectations are, um, limited, I guess is the best way to, right. to put it. I mean, really it comes down to, and I find it kind of encouraging is the road? I mean, who's totally. willing to really go out and try to put on a great show yeah. every single night and slug it out? And if you are and you're great at it, um, there's ways now that are easier than ever for people to get your music and hopefully come and buy a t-shirt and 
You know, we've sold more vinyl. That's the other thing that's hilarious. I mean, if you'd asked me 10 years ago if we'd be selling vinyl records more than we're selling CDs, I'd have said that you were crazy as shit, but it's it's that way every night. Right. You know, even at all even on a live show. I mean, yeah, and so do you maintain like a like uh like how many shows a year do you think you get out and do? Um, you know, for years it was in the 200 range, Jeez. which it's is a lot insane. of shows. Yeah. And then, you know, I got when I met my wife, that slowed down a little. When we had kids, that slowed down, you know, a more appreciable amount. And we're a little more human about it now. But it's probably yeah. um, at least 50 or 60 shows a year kind of regularly. And then album release times, it's probably closer to 80 or 100 worldwide probably. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Which is still Great. a lot. You yeah, know. it's a ton. Yeah, it's a ton. Um, and I assume that that's your immediate future is filled with lots of yeah. We finished this week the road. Yeah, we go home for a little bit, and then we've got one more week. Then we're off for the rest of the calendar year, and then uh, Europe. Um, I'm over there with Lucero in December. Oh, cool. Yeah, I love those guys. Yeah, and then nice. uh, the band and I'll be back the first part of the year, and then yeah, tour next year. Man, I've been wanting to interview that Ben Nichols dude for a long time. You should do he that. Never lined up. Oh, uh, yeah. Drop, put that in his ear when you're over I will. There I will yeah. certainly do. He's great, man. That yeah. whole band is cool. We saw a couple of those guys. The Social D run was in Memphis last week, and we oh, nice. a bunch of those guys were do, out. I think my buddy Matt Ross Spang worked yeah. on their latest record. Yeah, he did. Do you know Matt? I do. He engineered a record I made a couple oh, of years ago. Oh, great. He was the funniest dude in the room like in his quiet yeah totally twisted sort of way <laughs> he's a gifted guy man he's really in that chair there's not a whole lot of people better than he is I don't oh, he's amazing yeah. i actually met he reminded me when we were working together that i had met him years before that when he was i don't even know if he was an engineer yet he just worked in the gift shop at sun really and i went in there when we were in memphis you know on like crazy. a day off or whatever and he was like the dude selling t-shirts really? or whatever yeah wow yeah. Well, he's earned his stripes. So. Yeah, I was pl- I was happy that he reminded me that I had put him on the guest list for our gig. So <laughs> That's I think good. he he tw- he twiddled those knobs. Made him ex- extra, extra sweet good uh-huh. when, when we worked together. Good for you. Do you uh, would you like to play a song? Yeah, man, I would we, love uh, that. Great, let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah, this one is a uh, is called Mr. Barnum. It is a uh, loosely based on circus life and probably. Uh, will be easy uh, to see through who the song's really about when you listen to it, so. You told us all that this would be the biggest show that we had ever seen. You said it would be huge, the greatest of all time. That everybody here could have everything that they had ever dreamed But now the crowd is getting restless Thinking that you lied The ring master is gone It's just a clown down here all alone Oh, Mr. Barnum, won't you Please take your circus back home It seems your big top ten ain't as large as they said that it would be And all the things you said that we'd see inside are gone No strong man, no dancing bears, nobody swinging on trapeze It's just one bearded lady down here to tell us nothing's wrong And the ringmaster is gone Barnum, won't you please take your circus back home? It's your proudly 
weakness to a fall And you just laugh like it don't matter at all Oh, Mr. Barnum, won't you please take your circus back home The ring master is gone It's just a clown down here alone Oh, Mr. Barnum, won't you please take your circus Fantastic. Well, thank you. I was imagining when you were playing that that that's what it must be like to like be a fly on the wall when you're writing a song or something, like in your garage, strumming it out. It's pretty much the way it is, yeah. All right, cool. <laughs> awesome, man. Well, thank you. Man, thanks, thanks for, for taking by. the time it. to do this. This is really cool. Thank you. All right, that was Will Hogue on Walking the Floor. Doing an awesome acoustic rendition of Oh, Mr. Barnum from his latest record, My American Dream. Make sure you get on over to walkingthefloor.com, and I'm going to put up a bunch of links so you can find out where he is, what he's doing, buy his t-shirts, buy his CDs, and stream his music. Okay, and don't forget when you get done with that, uh, get on over to my other website, chrisshifflinmusic.com, and pre-order my new record, Hard Lessons, coming out on June 14th. First hundred copies of the vinyl bundle get signed. That's right. Signed copies. Get on it. Quick. Just less than a month and a half left to go. That's it for this week. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Adios, amigos!